Crime Watch Live tonight, where you can do something about crime. And there are police officers here from all across the UK, including from Grampian, from Northamptonshire, Cumbria, David Powers, Surrey, Sussex, Avon and Somerset, Devon and Cornwall, Hertfordshire, the Met, many more besides. Each detective has brought a case here that Crime Watch viewers can help to solve. They're important crimes, like these. The sex offender police fear is getting bolder and more dangerous. We do fear that this attacker may commit an offence again. He may attack another girl. The thugs who left a pensioner blind in one eye. How your calls really do count. The rapist caught just over an hour after being shown on Crime Watch. And a special tribute to Britain's bravest, the police officers who risked their lives to avert a potential disaster. Now, these police officers are from Hertfordshire, and they really pressed us to work quickly on this next case. They're worried the offences, which are already serious, will get even worse. Harpenden in Hertfordshire in early April. Fair enough. You know, I really doubt she but No, but I think, I think if it has been overhead, yeah, <laughs> then it, it will get round. And, uh, yeah. and you know, things, things get said, and I think, yeah. <laughs> oh, I think they may hear no. about it. And, uh, we know who the boys are, but who were these two fishermen that Sunday afternoon? And who was sitting in the garden of the Marquis of Granby pub at around 6 p.m.? The attacker seemed Mediterranean, perhaps even Asian. He was in his 30s. He was short, but with muscular arms, yellow teeth and a hairy chest. She froze with fear. She was crying out for help. Couldn't believe it was happening to her. She's in absolute fear of, of what this man is, is going to do to her. Good job. We'll see. Uh, an immediate thought went through her head. She, she realised she was still grasping hold of the, uh, the packet of cheddar crisps she had and said, I've got to leave these, I've got to let people know where the assault happened. Unbelievable courage that somebody so young could be thinking so far ahead as to, you know, what, what's going to be required when she does report it. It's unusual for victims to be so strong. We'll go to the nearest house, OK? <laughs> Two months later, in mid-June, a mile and a half from the attack, on Top Street Way, a stranger was hanging around. This is early evening on the Wednesday. Don't scream. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. Nothing. Be quiet. If you were driving past, you might have thought it was a father arguing with his daughter. Quiet! But if you saw them, call. Quiet! Get in. She can't move. She just is paralysed with fear. The man is very calm. She has the, the courage to be thinking, I've got to remember, I've got to help myself. I've got to help the police to catch this man. She's thinking, 
about the interior of the car, a sports bag on the back seat. She's trying to recall as much information as she can to help us catch this man. Frightened. Shut up. Shut up! We need to trace the cyclist. Pickett's Hill Lane, Wednesday, the 19th of June. Stay there. Get out. Out! The attack has totally affected her independence, her confidence. Shut up! Her whole character has changed. She's very quiet, very withdrawn. Come on! Puts on a very strong face. You can see it in her eyes. You can see the fear in both the girls' eyes of what they've gone through and what they are still going through. We do fear that this attacker may commit an offence again. He may attack another girl. We really need the public's help to come forward and identify this attacker before somebody else does get hurt. Dave, let's talk about the attacker a bit, first of all. What do you know about him? Well, both girls have been extremely brave. They've given us a really good description. We know that he's got a darkish skin complexion, described as olive or um, swarthy. And we know as well he seems to be very familiar with that lane, but we don't know why. Is it because um, he lives in the area or used to? In, in Harpenden? In Harpenden, yes. Or is it through work or another connection that we're not aware of? What about what he was wearing? Well, he was wearing um, sporty uh, um, attire on, on that particular occasion. You've got these, these tracksuit bottoms. Now, these are pr they're not the same, but they're, no. they're pretty similar, aren't they? Yeah, they're described as similar to, to worn by him on that day. And as you can see, they've got uh, red piping down the side of both legs. So that's pretty distinctive, so yes, someone might recognise that. He had a sports bag as well. What do you make of that? He did. He had a sports bag on the back seat that had some casual clothing cr scrunched up in the back. So maybe there is a sporty connection, or maybe it's just a pretense that... Uh, that he does. And there are two cars, which, which is a bit puzzling, yeah. isn't it? What do you think about that? Well, both cars are very important to us. The first one is the silver Astra, CLD registration, possibly with a four and eight in it. And the second is a small red car, M registration, similar in size and, and, and style to a Vauxhall Corsa. Now, we talked about witnesses in the film, didn't we? There's the, the, the cyclist who goes past, and then the, uh, the, the pub on April the 7th, wasn't it? The Marquis of Granby. Yes, yeah, Sunday, very warm day. Um, we're told that there are quite a few people sitting in the pub garden, uh, and we'd like to hear from them. They may have seen um, our uh, offender hanging around looking for his next, vi next victim. Now, we said that you believe that these already serious attacks are going to get worse. Why do you think that's going to happen? Well, there has been an escalation, and we're particularly concerned about the fact that one of the girls was forcibly taken off the street, walked up the street, and placed in the car, and driven half a mile down the lane. OK, well, let's see what we can do. Someone is going to know who this man is. If you can fit any of these clues to a name, call us here in the studio on 0500 600 600. Or, of course, you can call the incident room direct on 01727 796 900. We're going back uh, a year now to a train journey from Sussex into London. The story is told by a 73-year-old electrician. I was working full-time last year, even though I should have retired six or seven years ago. I've got some clients I've had for years. Most of my clients have become friends over the years. I've worked for some for 40 years. And um, these particular clients have an apartment, and I was going up there to... Um, do a day's work. East this is East At East Croydon, two men in their 20s were among those who got into his carriage. We passed through East Croydon and I thought, I'll go to the toilet. There were two fellows in the entrance to the train there, but I just walked straight through, went to the toilet, uh, and when I got back to my seat, they were sat where I'd, I'd been sitting. And there was all this fluid actually swimming about on the floor. So I picked my glasses up and said, is that necessary? And then I received a mouthful of, you know, four-letter words. I thought that was the end of it. 
um, just walked away and sat down elsewhere and thought that was the end of it. Robin was grabbed around the neck and hit so hard he's had to have three operations. Even so, he's now completely blind in his right eye. Look closely at the CCTV. Do they live near East Croydon? And look at that distinctive shirt. This was last August. Who'd blind a pensioner? Please, let's have their names. Our number here in the studio is always 0500 600 600. Now the head of Sussex CID, Detective Chief Superintendent Jeremy Payne. Think back to England's World Cup victory over Argentina. It was Friday the 7th of June and that night people were out celebrating. These pictures were taken outside the Ice Wharf pub on Camden Lock in North London. At around 11pm, three men were arguing. Shortly afterwards, Pierre Luigi Campioni was walking away from the pub when he was involved in a fight. He was stabbed to death. Now, we know lots of people were coming out of the pubs around that time. If you were there or you can identify these men, please ring in and tell us what you know. Still too early to give you much uh, in information on the calls we've been getting so far, but we've got uh, several names coming in already on those sex attacks uh, in Hertfordshire. And we've really got some great results on last month's cases. <laughs> In what seemed like a tragic accident, Paul Finan fell to his death from the fourth floor of a Tenerife hotel two years ago. But it soon began to look suspicious, and detectives hoped to find new witnesses. The Peel on Crime Watch was mainly to identify two women who were with Paul and his friends on the day it happened. We want to stress they're not suspected in any way, are they? Absolutely not, I will stress that. Not suspected of any involvement at all. And I'm not interested, really, in any activities that they were taking part in in Tenerife. I really know that they've got vital information that will unlock the mystery of Paul's death. After a call here to the studio, one of the women was traced. She's been helping the police, and they expect to talk to the other witness soon. A woman was followed and robbed in Hull city centre and was nearly killed. The mugger was female, and after seeing our reconstruction, a viewer called in with a name. Detectives are expecting to make an arrest shortly. Craig Swain was wanted in connection with sex offences against a 14-year-old boy, as well as crimes at guest houses near Scarborough. He was in Torquay when he saw himself on Crime Watch and went straight to the police. He's been charged with two gross indecencies and a deception. Seven viewers gave the same name for a man detectives knew only as Lassie. They wanted to talk to him about an alleged rape. As a result of the calls, he was arrested. He's been released on bail. Philip Bradshaw was wanted by Dorset Police. Independently of Crime Watch, he was picked up by another force and has now been charged with a serious sexual assault. In March, we showed a reconstruction of the fatal stabbing of Marilyn Garside on the doorstep of her elderly mother's house. With the help of Crime Watch, her husband Jim has been charged with conspiracy to murder and he's in custody awaiting trial. In May, we appealed on the murder of Terry Morgan, who was shot outside his house in rugby. As a result of new information, detectives now have a fresh appeal. They need to trace a woman who was waiting at the junction of Terry's Road and Hollowell Way at the time of the murder. She's white and in her late 20s. If that was you, or if you saw her, please call us now, 0500 600 600. Remember the Jubilee weekend? It was hot and sunny, and throughout the country, towns and villages were festooned in bunting. Guildford in Surrey was no exception, and for one woman there was extra cause for celebration. It was her stepdad's birthday, and she took him for a drink in the city centre. Tonight we're looking for people who were there as well. At 10 to 4 they left the White House pub, said goodbye, and she set off for yet another celebration. There was a party for a friend's birthday. As I was walking up the mount, I noticed a man walking up uh, in front of me. As I was approaching the junction with Woodland Avenue, um, he was 
in front of me, and he seemed to stop and pause and consider which way he should go. And then pretty soon after walking up Woodland Avenue, I heard him behind me. Um, and the reason I could hear him is because he was wearing tracksuit bottoms of um, very kind of loud material. I then uh, approached um, a pathway that's used by a lot of people in Guildford. Suddenly I heard the man who, behind me and he seemed to be coming very fast. I thought this guy's in a hurry and a little bit strange so I'll stop, turn around and let him pass. But instead of passing he came straight straight at me. We'd gone round to visit my brother-in-law's family and uh, I'd stepped outside shortly after arriving to have a cigarette and as I was talking to Martin I noticed out of the corner of my eye that there was some scuffling or a commotion, something going on in the alleyway about 30 yards down the hill. I screamed really loudly and um, luckily there were some people in their garden um, and they heard me and they ran out. By this time the man had um, been able to rip my skirt so I was actually in the in the pathway in my underwear. He just had time to sexually assault her. He's late 20s or early 30s, thin and wiry, about 5 foot 5 to 5 foot 7. His hair was dark and short and his eyes have been described as looking South American or Oriental. And take another look at the pattern on his shirt. It may look something like this, a red and gold dragon. Now, dear Simon Cork is here from Guildford. He's been working on the case since it happened. Now it's your turn to give him any information you can. Call us here 0500 600 600. And now from the National Crime Faculty, here's DS Jackie Haynes. I've got some pictures of people who'd rather you didn't see them tonight. They've all been caught on CCTV. Ticket staff at Queen's Road Railway Station in South East London were just doing their jobs when a man tried to push past them. After a scuffle, he left, but ten minutes later came back holding a bottle. One security guard bravely tried to calm the situation, but the man smashed the bottle and lunged at another security guard, attempting to stab him. Fortunately, he wasn't seriously hurt, but the next victim might not be so lucky. Who is he? These three burglars have twice been caught on cameras at BT premises in Slough, stealing electrical items. Now, they're either unaware that they're being filmed or they just don't care. Take a look at the three faces again and ring now if you can identify them. This man doesn't work at the Princess Margaret Hospital in Swindon, but he puts on a white coat and carries a clipboard. He goes into the x-ray department with an empty bag, leaving with it full, and then disappears. So did thousands of pounds worth of equipment, including a portable ultrasound machine. Tell us who he is. If any of these people look familiar, please call 0500 600 600. When we show wanted faces on Crime Watch, often for legal reasons, we can't say too much about what the suspects have done. Once they're convicted, though, we can put you fully in the picture. Here's a case in point. Last November, we were looking to find this man. And William Gleaves is wanted by my colleagues in Staffordshire for a dreadful sex assault. He has women's names tattooed on both What we arms. couldn't tell you then was that Gleaves had already been convicted for rape. He'd been released in 96, and for years it seemed that he'd stopped offending. But in 2001, he committed another sexual assault and immediately went on the run. That's when we asked for your help. Several calls came into the studio, and one in particular prompted immediate action. It gave an address in Blackpool. Arrangements were made to send local police round straight away. Just heard, uh, police are on their way to arrest somebody now, but obviously I'm not gonna tell you which case it is. William Gleave had changed his appearance a fair bit, but to no avail. He was arrested and locked up just 70 minutes after his face had been shown on Crime Watch. He's pleaded guilty and been sentenced to a total of 10 years. The 
biggest volume, of course, been getting so far has been on the Harpend and sex attacks, and really there's a lot coming in, including a same name that's come in twice. It's somebody who I think has got previous first sex assaults, and there are other things that may well fit on that. Obviously, we've got to be careful at this stage. We've got a woman who thinks that one of the cars involved in that attack was hers. It was stolen. It's since been recovered. That's being checked up right now. We've got a, a police officer saying there's somebody else who he thinks it might be. This is a different name to the one I mentioned earlier, but it's someone who's in court at the moment for similar offences. That, again, we've got to check up. And, of course, given that very, very few sexual crimes are actually by strangers, as we saw in the report this year, uh, earlier this week, it is quite possible this man has previous or is indeed already in trouble with the law. So there's a great deal coming in on these Harpen and sex attacks. Coming up, how citizens have already intervened to help fight crime. Suspicious, and the robber who was almost caught red-handed. Six life sentences handed down as a result of information given to Crime Watch. And how one man took on an attacker with a knife and her. saved a woman's life. If the police come, I'll kill you. To Cornwall now, and to a man who had a fairly easy morning. He put it to good use. He tracked a robber around St Austell for nearly an hour. Do we know who we play then? Hi there. Hi there. You haven't seen a guy in an orange vest walking around anywhere, have you? No. All right. No, he's just been looking very suspicious, that's all. Is it just the one check, is it? Yes, please. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It seemed uncanny, but here was a man who looked just like the bank manager had described. Since he had nothing much planned for an hour or two, he decided to keep an eye on him. On the 3rd of January, I was thinking I really must go down and pay my bills. And I was more concerned about getting down there before they close. And I went in there all, you know, casual. This is a holder! Money! Money! He's just gone into the Nat West. Twenties! Twenties! More? This is CCTV from the bank. He's in his 30s, he has close-cut hair, he's average height and possibly left-handed. Curiously, he spoke in single words, not sentences. More? More? In the time he'd taken to turn round, the silver car had vanished. He's an animal for what he's done to me. I'm not the same person anymore. He's taken away something that I had. I mean, I know I will get better. I know I'm strong. I'm a very strong person. Now, four months later, again midweek, a man in a blue cap was spotted outside the same bank. 
My husband has left me some correspondence taken to the bank because he does shift work. Uh, I don't regularly go, but once in three a week, something like that. Don't do nothing. Hurry up and give me your money. Hurry up! Put it on the counter. Hurry up! That's enough! I felt a sense of relief because I thought, oh, it's over now. He's got what he wanted. In fact, he got more than he wanted. This time, the bag of cash was booby-trapped. Anyone that terrorises someone like that must have something violent in them to want to do that. They must be very mean, sadistic street. Two hours later, a mile and a half down the same road, a man was concealing something underneath his tracksuit top. Was it the gunman hiding his ruined jacket? When he came back soon afterwards, he had a conspicuous red stain on his top and trousers. This is the SAO on the case, the senior investigative officer, Martin Orp. Mm. All these attacks taking place in this tiny little area, this village on the outskirts of St Arsenal, there are only, what, 15 or 20 shops there? That's right. Um, it's extremely distressing crimes to the victims and the community. And I'm especially appealing tonight for any family, friends or work colleagues of the person whose footage we've seen on the CCTV, which is very, very clear, who, and they may be able to connect him to this blue cap that we've seen with the white piping around the edge. Let me just explain that, can I? We had to go to some, some difficulty to find one which had piping that went up all the way around the edge. Now, they may be quite common, we didn't find so. It's if you can connect somebody who had this hat with that picture from the CCTV, which we'll show again in, in, in a moment, he's, he's <clears> fairly distinctive. Go with on. that picture, yes. And the orange jacket that we've seen. Which he was presumably using so that people would remember the orange jacket, not his face, I don't quite know. Quite probably, yes. And also, as we've seen from the last incident, he would have had clothing which was covered in red dye, and almost certainly his skin would have been covered in red dye. That, now, that red dye is very, very difficult to get out, if not impossible. I was going to ask you about that. How long... I mean, it went onto his face, probably, certainly his hands. How long would it have taken him to get rid of that? It's the natural shedding of the skin that will get rid of it off of his skin. So that happened at the end of May. He really would have been going around with that red stuff around him for very conspicuously for some time. For a number of weeks afterwards, uh, it's my view that he would have red dye on his head, around his neck, and possibly on his arms, just above where the gloves were. I said that some of the witnesses thought he had a Mediterranean look. Did he, or could that just have been a Cornish suntan? Uh, I, I think some of the witnesses, um, certainly from these incidents, and there's an earlier incident, only 50 yards away at Barclays Bank, have said that he may have a foreign accent. He said very few words, um, so that's supposition at this stage, but there is a possibility he is a, a foreigner to the area. We've got to be very careful, because he could have been putting that on. We just don't know. That's correct. Uh, he wouldn't <coughs> have been conspicuous for another reason. He didn't really get any money out of all these attacks. The incident had been two more in the area may not be nothing to do with him, but they may have been. He's not getting any cash, so friends, relatives wouldn't have noticed him very flush no. at the end of all. That's right, friends, relatives, colleagues. Um, I want to know um, who this person is, why he's in St. Austin. These are all midweek crimes that have been occurring. Uh, they've all been daytime crimes, and he must have a reason to be down there. One last on... July, one just after New Year in January, and then this last one on the 29th of May. Last one in May. Incidentally, we showed the silver car he was standing by. You don't know that that was his silver car. We're not sure he got into a silver car. No, we, Maybe, we, may not. We've got to be very careful in relation to the silver car. He was last seen standing by the silver car after the January offence. Uh, there was a possibility he got in that silver car and drove away, but we're not absolutely sure. OK, but look, there is a pretty good image. Please, if you know who it is, let us know. Uh, call us here on 0500 600 600 here to the studio. You can call the incident room direct if you want on 01726 treble. Two, but now here's another case where Crime Watch calls have already helped. Back in April last year, we showed shocking pictures of what led up to a murder in Luton in Bedfordshire. Following an argument at a nightclub, a gang attacked a teenager and chased him till he collapsed. Marcus Hall, seen here with his little brother, was kicked, beaten and stabbed to death. Following the uh, Crime Watch appeal, a number of the witnesses who we had previously identified, who were very reluctant to give their evidence, were very much persuaded by the emotion from Marcus's mother and father. I'm waiting for him to come through the door. I'm looking in rooms to see if he's there, and I know he's not there. 
With witnesses now prepared to go to court, police had enough evidence to make arrests. Six people were picked up in Luton and in South London, and all of them were charged jointly with Marcus's murder. It was a very long trial. The trial lasted for 16 weeks, one of the longest trials in Bedfordshire Police's history. Marcus's mum describes the trial as horrendous. She says the defendants were laughing in the dock. One of them, he like, tried to intimidate. I wasn't having that, because as far as I'm concerned, you're nobody. The prosecution claimed joint enterprise. In other words, the whole gang kicked or stabbed Marcus, so they were all guilty of his murder. The witness evidence unlocked by Crime Watch was compelling. But two of the defendants denied they'd been there at all. Their lies were exposed by facial mapping, comparing CCTV evidence from the scene with pictures of the defendants. In the case of the two defendants that said they weren't there, I was able to show uh, a relatively high degree of correspondence between the uh, head and face shape and the distribution of facial features from a number of angles at a number of points in the video sequence. The jury reacts quite well to the type of information we give them. We, we show the pictures of the two individuals being compared and, and lines across them that show the correspondence of features. All six of these defendants were found guilty. My reaction when the verdict came through was, yes. But then, you know, the judge started to reel off, um, like, this one got life. And then it was like, after the, the third life, my, it's like my, I went deaf. I couldn't hear anything. After that, I, you know, it was such a relief to know that none of them is walking, that, you know, I just started to cry. And that was just like a great relief for me. You know, it's like a weight has been lifted off my shoulder to know that they're going to be locked away for a long time and they won't be doing this to somebody else's child. The attack was so sustained and so vicious, there are two men police still urgently want to speak to, Adebayo Ikan and Kevin Monty. Where are they tonight? Let's try and solve some more now. Here again is the head of Sussex CID, Detective Chief, Chief Superintendent Jeremy Payne. Detectives investigating a series of robberies in Gloucestershire need to speak to these two, Levente Gregus and Patrick Clegg. In frightening attacks, householders were tied up and property, jewellery and cars were stolen. The latest robbery in March involved a Saab 900 car, N346JHY, which is still missing. Both men are tattooed. Clegg in particular has a number, a number on his arms and his hands. If you spot them, don't tackle them. Call us straight away. And Murray Coots faces extortion and drugs charges going back to May last year, but he's disappeared. He was last spotted in Aberdeen, where the crimes happened, but now he could be anywhere. If you know where he is, let's get this one sorted out. And have you seen this man? He's Martin Williams, and he's wanted in connection with the abduction and rape of an 18-year-old girl in Bristol. Williams is a lorry driver, and we're fairly confident he's been travelling around somewhere in the country in a white Renault Arctic, just the tractor unit. Its registration number is P834RWR. He's known to be violent, so if you know where he is, don't approach him. Call us 0500 600 600. Eric Peachy failed to turn up at Swansea Crown Court to be sentenced for a serious sexual assault against a child. He may have connections in Brighton, but he could be anywhere in the country. Do you know where? And if you run a B&B, &B, take a careful look at Christopher Coulthard. He's wanted by officers in Gloucestershire and Derbyshire. They want to interview him about money that's disappeared from numerous churches. Clearly he likes to travel, but as police have his red Mazda 626, what car is he now driving? And most importantly, where is he tonight? Northamptonshire police are looking for Sean MacDonald in connection with an attempted murder last October. A 39-year-old man was stabbed repeatedly and was lucky to survive. Sean MacDonald comes from Merseyside but does have connections in London. And Ronald Julian is now 60 and until last year was the treasurer for the United Reformed Church in Falmouth, Cornwall. He disappeared and so did thousands of pounds of church funds. He may be in South Devon or Dorset but also has North London connections. He's been known to sell lottery type tickets door to door Has he knocked on yours. But where is he now? We're getting great information in. The Harpenden sex attacks, we are going great guns on that. Nick's already told you about some of the information coming in. Now someone has rung in who thinks they were a witness on the golf course where one of the attacks took place. 
And the pensioner who was attacked by thugs and blinded one eye when he was on a train, a very good response to that. Two names, uh, one name rather, has come in twice with an address, so that's very promising. Now let's talk about a case that has been puzzling detectives for eight years. Detective Superintendent Steve Morrison is here from Thames Valley Police. They've had good results from Crime Watch in the past. This time he needs your help to solve a murder. It's eight years on, but the events of Saturday the 3rd of December 1994 are still fresh in the minds of those who knew John Shepherd. John was beaten and stabbed to death as he counted up the day's takings at the John Horwood betting office in Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire. John put up a fight and one of the attacker's blood was found at the scene. We're looking for a name to match the DNA sample left behind by John's killer. Now, alongside Steve here is Mary, John's wife, so thank you both very much for coming in. Steve, first of all, after eight years, why now? Why are we relaunching this appeal now? That this was an awful, an awful attack. Uh, the frost here and the, and the violence was, was beyond anything that we've seen. Um, our intention is, is not to uh, uh, get witnesses to come forward here. People who are going to be eyewitnesses or provide evidence. It's if, names you're after tonight. Exactly. Isn't it? We're after somebody who was uh, involved with the local criminal fraternity in, Ab in Aylesbury all those years ago, whose loyalties have changed, who may have moved on, who can tell us the name. If we have a name, we can eliminate the person from the inquiry, or we can actually get to the point where we find out whether those people were responsible or not. And Mary John, he was a very popular guy, wasn't he? He was well liked in the community. Oh yes, he was very well respected. Um, I don't know of any enemies that he had. He was just too well liked. And he was a hard working man as well, wasn't oh, he? Oh yes, he was. He was a workaholic, <laughs> unfortunately. Now what would it mean to you tonight, if we do manage to get some information, if someone rings in with that name that Steve needs? It would mean everything to me, my daughter, his brother, his sister. Um, John wasn't ready to go. Um, his, his life was taken away from him. He was denied from seeing his daughter get married. Um, she's expecting a baby. Um, never met his new son-in-law. Um, it would just mean so much. And as I said to you earlier, it's a, an ache. It's like a pain and I want it to go away. I really do. I want it to go away. And if there's anybody, anybody out there that knows anything, please clear your conscience and let us put John to rest. And John was very security conscious, wasn't he? So how do you think these people would have got into the betting shop? I think there's a lot of speculation. The, the motive appears to be robbery. That's why I'm convinced. Somebody locally would have known what, what's happened here, why this, this violence took place. All we need is a name. People can ring anonymously. We can then take the matter on from there. The, the only barrier against people re receiving a huge reward is the fact that they don't make a phone call. If they make that phone call, we can deal with the case, we can prosecute it. We just need the name or names of the people who carried out this horrendous attack. People are listening now, you want a name, what would you say to them? Why? Why? You know, it's such a horrendous crime. You know, um, I don't know how they sleep. Um, I just really don't understand. Um, we need to know why. For well, what reason? He was just somebody doing his job, um, waiting to come home for tea. OK, well, let's see. Thank you very much, both of you, for coming and Let's see what we can get tonight. You heard it there. It's a name that Steve needs. Steve and his colleagues are really serious about catching whoever did this. A name is what they need, and the reward has doubled from £10,000 to £20,000. Call us here in the studio, or you can call the Instant Room direct if you want, on 01 296 396 170. Well, names are coming in in abundance in other cases, not least, in fact, most on the Harpenden and sex attack. We told you how one name keeps coming up. It's now come up four times. And there are other indications that it's the same person that are coming in from other callers too. Fiona already told you the same name has come in twice on the train attack. Uh, on the St Austell robberies, we've got all sorts of names coming in on that. Uh, a possible a link that a, a PC thinks there may be to a crime in, in Hampshire. And incidentally, there's a substantial reward on that put up by NatWest Bank. We think that one man we're after has cheekily rung in here on this desk and said, well, he's been trying to taunt the police officer who's sitting, sitting here and actually almost took the call himself. 
Anyway, we're now going to go for something of uh, a celebration of good deeds. Um, the Police Bravery Awards. This is an annual event, it's growing in importance, and it really is, as I say, something to celebrate. It's run by the Sun newspaper in connection with the Police Federation. Earlier this month, local winners travelled from all across the UK to spend the afternoon at a high-profile reception at 10 Downing Street. In the afternoon, they were joined by Cherie Blair, the Home Secretary David Blunkett, and many other distinguished guests. But these awards also recognise the bravery of civilians, ordinary people who've shown extraordinary courage. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please give a big welcome to this year's Childando Award winner, Professor Alistair MacDonald. Professor of Psychiatry Alistair MacDonald stopped and got involved when others just walked by. It was a dark November evening and I was coming back from work and driving slowly because of the traffic. It's five o'clock, welcome to PM. And I saw a couple walking away from me on the opposite side of the road ahead of me. And he had her in a headlock. Don't. And I thought at first they were just fooling around. Please let me go, I don't know you. I want to show you what they have done to my house. I don't know you. After a while it seemed to be going on rather a long time. And then a man was walking past them turn round and look back at them in a curious sort of way. And I thought there is something funny going on. I know you didn't do anything. It was the business people. <laughs> I decided to pull over and find out what was going on. When he was dragging me along, I just caught hold of the, the railing and I said, OK, I'm going to stay put. And he's not going to move me. Well, I just hold on to all that, the strengths I had at the time. Let go. Let go of it. No, I don't want to go. Come with me. Let go. No, if you're going to kill me, kill me here. Don't come any closer. It's none of your business. Are you OK? Help me. Help. As soon as I heard her crying and saw his knife, I realised that this wasn't just fooling around. Stay away. I backed away from him and went up the road a little, and there was a phone box there. Police. Tulsa Estate. Seeing him there was a big encouragement. He gave me the strength to hold on. After I'd made the call to the police and I was standing there, it suddenly occurred to me that when the police arrived, he would head off with her into the estate. So I circled round behind them and stopped a man who was passing by and asked him to help, and he said yes. If you come here, I'll kill her. If the police come, I'll kill you. I heard the sirens, and he must have heard them too, because he started stabbing her. He still had her in a headlock, and he was stabbing her in the head and neck. And I remember feeling sharp pain in my neck. And I, I tried to, you know, free myself at that moment, and I think... The professor stepped in at that moment as well. Leave her alone! Stop it! It's nothing to do with you! All sorts of things go through your head, but uh, the, I did think this could be my daughter there, not just some stranger. Leave her! Stop it! I was a nuisance to him, and he just wanted to get rid of me. He wasn't that interested, but uh, so he was waving his knife, hoping that that would get me away. And when it didn't, I suppose... You know, he had to do something more. Delta 3-0, TOI. I see three men out I see one male. We had our lights on, we had our sirens on, and this, the, the black chap then 
um, was swinging the knife towards the white male. He then stabbed me through the arm. He's stabbing a bloke right in front of police. You know, what the hell are we going to do? But I realised that by letting go of the girl to hit me, it gave her the opportunity to get away, and she did. There was no acknowledgement or recognition, as far as I'm concerned, of police, our presence. He wasn't aware at all. Knife, knife, knife. So when I got out, I'm then faced with him. He, he's striding up the hill uh, towards me with the knife in hand. Stop, police! Police, stop! Drop it! Drop it! Drop it! If you put me back in the same position, in front of him stabbing her, I would do the same again, absolutely. I was so angry, I would be angry again. I'd be angry at any, anything like that going on. Uh, completely outrageous what he was doing. I'm really grateful to the professor, because I think the professor was the only person who actually acknowledged what happened and what was happening. And he didn't turn a blind eye. He actually, you know, came to help me. And he gave me the strength to hold on. And I'm sorry he, he was hurt in the process. But he, he, he gave me a second chance in life, I think. And I really like to thank him for that. 42 remarkable stories of police heroism. The judges then had to choose eight finalists and the winners for this year's Police Bravery Award. Due to their outstanding bravery, the overall winners of the Police Bravery Award for 2001 are Mark Scott and Stephen Stenson Pickles. We can't show Stephen Stenson Pickles because he's working undercover. But both men were off duty and making their way home after a long day when their story began. Hello. Yep. Hello, love. Pix and I had just finished a murder yeah, inquiry, yeah. and uh, we had to drop some stuff off at oh. Bury St Edmunds. Um, Pix had to uh, pick up a bottle of milk for his uh, daughter's breakfast on the way home. And on the way, as me and Scott normally do, have an argument about everything, really, and start arguing about where she should go. Tesco's will be quicker. It won't. Right, we'll go the way you want to go. And I got my own way in the end, and we ended up at the check garage. There's a man in there. I think he's gone mad. He's pouring petrol everywhere. It does sound a cliche, I know, but uh, you, when you turn out to an incident, uh, you just think you are a policeman and you have to deal with it immediately. Keep people away from the building and we'll have a look inside. I think it's just instinct, really, when you've been in the job for a little while. You've got five seconds to get out of here. Or I'm going to blow the place up. The first thing that hit me was the petrol, the smell of it. Uh, there was petrol all over the floors. I've tried to walk across the floors and it's a bit like it's a knockout, you're, you're slipping everywhere. It, it actually took your breath away, you couldn't breathe properly. What's going on here, mate? Why have you tracked petrol everywhere? It's over. What's the problem? It's over. You can get out if you want. It's up to you. We can't leave you. You know we can't do that. What's your name? Pete. Peter. Do you live around here? I live up there, across the road. How'd you get the petrol everywhere? Brought you with me. She dumped me. She doesn't understand. She doesn't understand how much I love her. I don't want to live anymore. I want to kill myself. We've all been there, mate. Did you have a row? Was it your girlfriend? We were going to get married. I was due to get married within six weeks. Uh, I suddenly started 
concentrating on my daughter Emily, who was only a year old at the time, and Sally Ann, my wife to be, and realised that unless I really put them out of my mind um, and concentrated on the job in hand, I wasn't going to get out there safely. Basically, what we've got is we've got a, a gentleman in there. He's bounced the place with petrol. Okay. He's got a French set light to it. He's got a knife. Don't come round this side of the counter. I'm just trying to get somewhere a bit drier. Want some fags? Want some fags? Yeah. Far too dry in here. Far too dry. I suddenly had a pool of spirits coming towards me, and I didn't really fancy becoming flambeard cup. But the immediate obstacle was the knife. And um, we're taught in training for officer safety training that you have a reactionary gap, and anybody with a knife can rush you. Um, in a very short space of time. However, I also knew that that was the same for him, so when the opportunity arose, mm. I would um, get myself into a position where I could rush him and, um, and take the knife out. It, it was really dangerous at that point, and I think me and Mark kind of looked at each other and felt that we really had to do something now, we had to move. Pigs! They both disappeared. I immediately ran towards the counter, jumped over it. Hicks was like a mountain goat and leapt across the, uh, the, the cashier's counter. We started struggling, both of us, with the man on the floor, but it was so slippery behind there. There was petrol and spirit that he'd pulled over the floor. And as we tried to get up, stand him up, we were just slipping over and falling back down again. It then became a bit surreal because we'd stopped and we were puffing and panting and we're, we're in fumes. It went quiet and I could hear this clicking. It's in his hand! His hand! Get his hand! <clears throat> I just felt in immense relief that we'd actually survived it. It wasn't really until we got outside and um, we looked at each other and had a little bit of a hug on the, on the forecourt that we realised could have died there. It's a fantastic night. We, of course, uh, when things get rough, really rely on the police. But remember, they rely on us. And we're getting some tremendous calls tonight. We're going to have a great deal to tell you when we uh, come back. Incidentally, you could always contact us about any of the cases that we've featured on the programme via the website. That's at www.bbc.co.uk forward slash crime. Not only can you contact us there, but you can find quite a lot of details there on the cases that we've featured on the programme tonight. And if you want numbers of the local incident rooms, you'll find those on CFAX on page 621. And our final phone lines are open until midnight tonight and again from 7.30 tomorrow morning until midnight. We'll be back at 10.35 with a Crime Watch update. Once again, uh, it looks like we're going to have a lot to tell you when we come back in about uh, half an hour's time. Next month, we're back on the uh, 21st of August. That's going to be a special programme that looks at the crimes that Crime Watch viewers have helped to solve throughout the year. And there's a lot of them. So don't have nightmares, not at least on our account. Sleep well. Good night. Good night.